So I'll, I'll try to direct. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, I will direct each question to an expert. Uh, uh, I'll read from the Q&A and, and questions that were asked. Uh, but any speaker who wants to weigh in, uh, please hit the raise button, the raise hand button, and I'll bring you into the discussion. Here is a question about some new treatment for cervical HPV and low-grade SIL, uh, like papillocare. What is your experience with it? Could that be a game changer in getting rid of HPV-related? So. For that question, I would like to ask Dr. Gabi Aran to, uh, to talk, because I know that he was investing it uh, quite extensively. Dr. Aran? Yes, thank you. Um, well, I can say about the papillo care that, uh, first of all, we need to know that uh, this treatment is a treatment that can, uh, well, firstly, enhance the ability of the immune system to react to the HPV. Um, and uh, it uh, goes by three ways of uh, enhancing it. First of all, it enhances the repetilization of the cervix and the vagina. It uh, changes the microbiome of the of the vagina in order for it uh, to uh, react better for the uh, HPV, and it changes the non-inflammatory uh, survival of uh, of the HPV. But I think that the most effective uh, um, way that the H that the papillo can react to the HPV is by changing the stress amount of the patient that takes it. I think that the way that you need uh, to react when, when you get the, um, the news that you have HPV, the way that patient usually react is by a, a very high stress uh, reaction. To be in charge of their situation. And this way, they lower the stress uh, reaction. And uh, we know that stress is not good for the immune system. And we see that the um, reaction is better when they have something to treat it with. Thank uh, you. Uh, may, may I ask uh, uh, the other, uh, the other uh, lecturers, what is your experience with those HPV treatments like uh, papillo care? Uh, do, do any of the other uh, have experience? Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Pedro Vieira Baptista first, and yeah. then Professor Bakni. Okay, I, I can agree with Dr. Gabby that some women, they really want to do something, but their disappointment, their frustration is even higher when they return positive, having spent a lot of money in a treatment. Personally, um, I have no experience, but uh, the study supporting, I, I'm I'm not a fan of, of those studies. I think they have uh, quite uh, some flaws uh, that prevent us from recommending it. And my purpose was to say that there's a recently pay, published paper, position paper from ESGO about the use of probiotics and prebiotics in gynecological cancers. And it addressed also uh, HPV infection, cervical cancer, and the papillo care and the current recommendation from ESGO is that there is no evidence at the moment to recommend it. But I can agree for some patients, if they want to use it, it won't hurt except for their wallets. Thank you, Professor Vaknin, and then Professor McGee. Um, I agree. In, in uh, uh, As I use it, for, again, for very uh, small uh, group of patients which are have a lot of stress and they want to do something and I think because it doesn't hurt and it might be having some a good effect uh, I suggest it but very much to a very small group of patients and for a low uh, LSIL and not uh, higher than that. Thank you Dr. Mergi. Yes, we had this discussion during the last IFCPC meeting in the <clears throat> Colombia, and most of the speakers think that for the moment there is no evidence that this there is no medical treatment efficient uh, against HPV infection. 
for the moment there is no efficient treatment and i we know that if you have an hpv infection you have a different microbiome a vaginal microbiome than the other woman and we know also that we have a preterm uh, possibility even if we are not treated by a LETS or a laser or anything because you have an HPV infection, so microbioma is different, and then you have a special risk of having a premature labor. Then we know that the microbioma of the vagina is quite different in HPV positive patient. And if you modify this microbioma, you could improve the immunity, but we doesn't know how long it's, it's, it remains. And we, we have seen those, uh, some papers showing that if you stop the treatment, you stop the microbiome modifications, then the microbiome return to this initial issue. And then I'm not sure that those treatments are long-term efficient in HPV infection or low-grade disease. And I, I share the same idea that Dr. Vieira Batista Pedro. Pedro. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Well, there were a couple of uh, papers or studies showing some uh, evidence that uh, uh, popular care uh, can make the change. Uh, so I look forward to see more more studies. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, they will convince uh, those who are uh, not convinced yet. Professor Vaknin, you wanted to add? I only wanted to add that there is issues that we have also to consider in patients which has a, a bit of chronic infection, which is like stopping smoking, which is, uh, I think, even more important than uh, other things. And cheaper. Yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> okay, Dr. Uh, Tati. Yes, I, I agree that stop smoking is the first issue that you must... Uh, say to the patient and the, to papillocur, Care, I, I, I read the Paloma study, which is the, the huge paper from the Papillocur, Care, and the index of cure is no more than 60%. This is what you can expect in some patients, not in, in immunosuppressed patients, you know? But I think there, there would be uh, another studies about Papillocur. Care. Sometimes there is a lot, a lot of conflict of interest. We need a longer study, a longer period. Yes. Right, right. Yes. Uh, I know that in Greece, they talk a lot about lifestyle. So uh, Dr. Bilirakis, uh, what is your position? Well, uh, I think that uh, there are women uh, having plain HPV infection, even without any lesion at all. And they're asking for something. So we have used popular care. So if it is a habitual regression or if it is something for real, I can't say anything because there are no enough data. But the question is, do we have something to lose if we provide public care? Money. Well, okay. Uh, okay, Dr. Uh... Carlos. Uh, I, I agree with Dr. Vieira, with Pedro, that uh, we're not uh, enough support and we have now a lot of products like Papillocare, Care, who promotes uh, uh, HPV regression or inclusive lesion. So <laughs> we need more evaluation and more studies. Because, uh, for example, in, in Colombia, we have uh, now papillocare and we have uh, deflagin that is selenita plus uh, citric acid. And it's, it's a lot of uh, uh, products for the next year. And we need to have more studies to, to give an advice about that. You know, I would say we need to keep an open mind because when the vaccine was introduced not everybody was happy and uh, saw that it will work so and, and things have changed completely dr freeman uh freeman wang um 
Yes, I am. Um, we have some patients who have used uh, papilla care. Um, uh, and I agree, I think we do need more evidence, but I, like you, do think it's important to be open-minded. Um, completely anecdotally, I have three or four patients who have had biopsy-proven high-grade disease who have refused to have standard treatment and have then gone on to either use that or medicinal mushrooms. So they've used reishi, shikake, coriolis, uh, cordyceps. And um, uh, bizarrely, although they've agreed to return and have biopsies, in all of them, though it has taken a year to 18 months, their lesion has regressed. Now, I can't tell you whether those would be lesions that would regress anyway. And on the basis of my three or four patients, I wouldn't uh, change or advise that that's standard treatment. But these are women, intelligent women, who have chosen not to go by the conventional route but have agreed to be monitored. Um, so I think there's something in it, but I think it needs more evaluation and research. Thank you so much. So let's move uh, to another issue. First, thank you very much for all your presentations, which gave us a lot of ideas and tips on how uh, to increase the compliance. Uh, we haven't talked much about the partners, the male partners of uh, of the of our women uh, so the question that uh, came is should a partner of a woman diagnosed with hpv 16 and cin1 be referred for hpv vaccination uh is i i know there are no guidelines but what is your opinion um may i start with uh, elma <clears throat> yeah uh, thank you that that's an important question we uh, hear on a daily basis in our offices and outpatient clinics. Uh, there are some data from Canada, uh, which are certainly preliminary, but they indicate that uh, the vaccine also might uh, limit the transmission. And since we know that partners of HPV positive persons are at risk for developing disease, it's certainly a point to discuss the vaccine, even if we don't have strong data, but just using our common clinical sense, it makes use. And I usually discuss this with my patients and also their partners and uh, a substantial proportion also takes the vaccine then and I, th I think we can give a recommendation even without strong data at the moment. Thank you. Do any of oh, uh, Dr. Murgi? I would like to ask a question to Elma Juro, <laughs> just in case we saw that you are proposing, and most of the people representing has proposed to vaccine patient after the age of the vaccination initially, after 20 years old, after 30 years old, after 40 years old. And, and you say that uh, ca Canadian presentation says that you can vaccine men which are uh, have a relation with a woman infected by an HPV. And then you think that it could be efficient then. But I see in the lay study published in the New England and in the, some UK studies that more you are vaccinating younger, more efficient you are in terms of invasive cervical cancer, invasive. And then do you think that it's really efficient to vaccinate patient after 30, 40 years old, or even after 25 years old and I thought that in the in the publication you show in your presentation that the efficiency after 17 years old was much less in, um, efficient than uh, than before. Um, yes, that's that's a really important question, and uh, the problem is uh, we come to different results when we uh, talk about a vaccination program, and that's very clear that the earlier we vaccinate, the more benefit we get out of the money we're investing in that program. And I think uh, the consideration of Israel to 
go to the age of nine with uh, the vaccine is uh, a good consideration and we did the same thing in Austria. But looking at the individual patient, so having a 35-year-old woman in front of you and she wants to get the best protection, then we can say, well, in the clinical trials, looking at uh, individual patients, when this woman is at the moment uh, negative for HPV negative in general or for most of the types, then we can have clear data that she's protected in the future against infections with the other types and also with against reinfections with the same type. So uh, our patients, we can counsel in that way. If we are uh, counseling public health or the Ministry of Health, uh, then uh, it's quite clear that we should opt for the young age. And th that's a complex thing, but that's the data we have. Do you have an age li a limit of age to vaccinate? Uh, we recommend it actively up to the age of 45, since we have data up to the age of 45. But in Europe, we don't have any uh, upper age limit uh, in the license. So uh, after the age of 45, we uh, do it permissive. So if someone wants to get protection, uh, we vaccinate. Okay. When we continue with the question, I see that uh, a few of the questions were answered in writing by the panel members, so I encourage the audience to go and see the answered questions. I won't go into those who were answered because we are short of time. <clears throat> I'd like to read some of the open questions. Uh, Dr. Nina Madnani from uh, India, thank you for participating. She mentioned that in India, the screening for cervical cancer is 1%. Oh, yeah. uh, 1%. <laughs> It is uh, very low. Dr. Uh, Murgi, you are in charge of the world as uh, president of the IFCPC. What uh, steps are taken in India or in other low-income countries uh, to increase uh, screening and vaccination? Well, I am not in charge of India, of course, as you know. <laughs> I am not in charge of the world. In, yeah, in charge of the data, yeah. Organize communication between countries in the world to improve cervical cancer prevention and mostly HPV-related disease preventions. Then in low-income countries or middle-income countries, I'm sure that we have a, a lot of work to do. And I think that the most important thing to do is really to improve vaccination because we have a lack of uh, pathology services to HPV testing. And perhaps I will show you in my conclusion, because I have some slides to conclude this webinar, you, you asked me to do that. Then I would say that perhaps in the future, we could use AI, artificial intelligence, in order to do HPV testing and perhaps to help to cervical disease uh, visualization or identification. Great idea. Uh, here is somebody who asked, uh, what is the role of vaccinating with a non-avalent HPV vaccine persons previously vaccinated with a quadrivalent, uh, especially when they get diagnosed with a new CIN1? I know it's an issue that uh, we can spend uh, two hours talking about it, but any one of you would like to answer that one. Does anybody? Yeah. Dr. Mergi, yeah. Elma. I let, I let Elma answering this question. Elma, you start. Much uh, better. Yeah, we know that uh, the five additional types of the nine valent vaccine are especially important in older women. So over the age of 50, um, we see a lot of cancer related to HPV 33, and it also pays off to... Um, get a good protection against HB45 um, causing some adenocarcinomas of the cervix. Uh, well, when you're vaccinating the program with the bivalent or quadrivalent vaccine, so you, you already have a very good protection. If you want the best protection, 
uh, you could discuss it to get it out of pocket. It probably pays off, but certainly also on an individual basis. And if you have a CN1, a low grade lesion, yeah, uh, you should also get, get the vaccine. As we know, uh, also those being infected and those with disease, they benefit from the vaccine. Let me remind you that in Sweden, uh, the program is giving everybody at the time of the first screening to give the non-avalent vaccine, nev never mind if she has already received the quadrivalent vaccines because of the 20% additional protection. Yeah. Uh, Pedro. Just a very personal perspective. Uh, and it is, For most patients now, it is obviously out of pocket. But I tend to recommend it very actively to women at risk of uh, having a transplant or having the need for some immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, women with lichen planus, for instance, uh, I always recommend it, but it's obviously no guidelines on that as far as I know. It's just a personal perspective. Thank you very much. I must say that within the question and answer, many uh, Thank you all speakers for their uh, talks and thank us for the uh, organizing of the webinar. And as I said, most of the questions were uh, answered uh, already, so I won't go uh, go into more questions. Um, I see a question by Dr. Durand. Thank you for participating in Israel uh, in HPV faster scheme. Is vaccination funded to age of 45? or just to 26. So in Israel, I will answer that one, uh, Nancy. Um, uh, it is in the health basket, means it is fully or almost fully uh, covered until the age of 26 as of now. Uh, between ages 26 to 45, it is uh, funded partially. Uh, so at a reasonable uh, payment, they can receive it up to age of uh, 45. Thank you for your question. Uh, what else? Um, I think we covered the other questions. So, okay, let me see if there's another one. Okay, here is a question. Where are we in terms of HPV screening in the male population? You know, um, Screening uh, in the male population is much more difficult. Uh, do any of you send your patients for screening or high risk groups for screening? And what kind of HPV screening? Mario, do you have experience? Well, there are no validated uh, tests uh, for uh, screening for male. And so the finding of particular HPV doesn't mean a risk of uh, intrapetalial penile or anal uh, neoplasia. So uh, more than 20 years ago, we started to screen uh, male partners and uh, more than 50% were different for uh, women. And so uh, we increase the risk of divorce separating couple. And so we stopped to screen uh, men after CIN diagnosis. Of course, we uh, have to uh, send male partners if uh, there are HPV uh, uh, 6 and 11 um, lesions, so condylomatous lesion, to a dermatologist to uh, avoid the recurrence uh, treating the male uh, HPV-related lesion, but not HPV DNA screening. And uh, Elma. Uh, the problem with uh, HPV testing in men is we have no algorithm how to deal with the result. And we know from uh, Anna Giuliano that men are positive up to 50% at any age. So the likelihood to find a positive test is very high. And we can only say inshallah and nothing else. So that's very unsatisfactory. And for that reason, we strongly discouraged to test men. Yes. Dr. Mergi? Yes, I agree with this conclusion because the, the burden of uh, 
HPV related cancer in men are is 10% of the burden of the, of cancer in women. So the main problem for men is uh, oropharyngeal cancer and there is at the moment no meaning of detection, prevention or uh, or treatment of course we have when the cancer is is uh, uh, diagnosed, but there is no meaning to prevent any uh, oropharyngeal cancer. An HPV testing of the of the oral cavity is not efficient. Then I think it's not efficient at the moment to detect men, even if the the women are positive. And I, I'm not sure that using condoms is efficient to to prevent any reinfection, because. In HPV infection can be transmitted by digital and not only by uh, 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 sexual uh, penetration, you know. I would say that we need guidelines in this area, even though we don't have evidence based yet, but uh, experts can, you know, uh, express their opinion and, and some guidelines are needed because I get many questions and everybody is uh, acting in a different way. Elma, you want uh, to add anything? Uh, you're muted, probably. Probably. Sorry, no, um, uh, I agree with that. Yeah, and so we don't recommend uh, condoms. And uh, there are some data which show a mild effect, but it's more stigmatization. And so we want to keep it relaxed. So we recommend vaccination in that um, scenario, but not condoms. All right, there are quite a few more questions, but our time is running up. So I apologize to all those uh, whose questions were not answered. Uh, I think that one conclusion is that we need more webinars like that because there are many questions from all over the world. We had participants from many countries, uh, people from Ghana, from uh, Azerbaijan, from India, all expressed their uh, thanks for our um, our webinar. And again, I apologize uh, to those who whom we couldn't we didn't have enough time to uh, to answer the question. And now, as we wrap up, I want to give huge thanks to our speakers for their brilliant talks answering our questions and joining the discussion thank to the audience and to close things off i'll hand it over to dr mergi for some final words and conclusion jean luc do you have my screen yes yes, yes oh. we can see you then in conclusion i want of course, thanks to the, the, the Israeli organization for the, this webinar. It was very interesting and showing a lot, la a large number of countries worldwide. And we may see that in, in conclusion, in high income countries, the WHO goal to, could be realistic to, to vaccine 90% of young girls to screen 70% of women and to treat 90% of women. And we have to insist to this related to, but also to recognize, I told you a few seconds before then, we had a very important increase of HPV related cancer in men in oropharyngeal area. And to, in, to increase the, the vaccination, we have to be very efficient. We know that this vaccine is very efficient for HPV incidence. It's efficient for to, to prevent any vaginal and vulvar HPV disease and cancer and pre-cancer in those patients. And the treatment of those cancer is very, is, is a, it could be a disaster for, for women. We have to insist, of, of course, to the neutral gender of the vaccination, which can help and in my country, for example, in France, we have a very high problem to vaccine people. And I think that the neutral gender of vaccination could help countries to increase the number of patients vaccinated. And perhaps in the future, we may have some evidence, uh, scientific evidence that one dose is sufficient. And perhaps 
if one dose is sufficient, perhaps we could increase the vaccination in girls and boys. The second step is to increase screening, and we see that we saw that in France, but also in UK, but we see also in other countries, and then even, for example, in in Greece, that the screening is not completely coverage, but we don't have an, a sufficient coverage of the, of the population, and we have to improve information to population, and perhaps the future could be in self-sampling. We didn't discuss about self-sampling today, but we will have another webinar to discuss about how to increase screening and how could the self-sampling could help us in detecting HPV-related disease. For the other country, we had the example of you know, South America, Argentina, and Colombia. And for middle and low income country, we have the question of the, uh, uh, the gynecologist from India. The problem is the availability and the price of the vaccines and to have a, a, a coverage of vaccination and the help of national health systems to help people to be vaccinated. The second problem is the HPV test and pathology services not services with a cervix, but services has a service. Uh, and the, perhaps to help that, uh, I told you that perhaps the future will be the role for artificial intelligence. And we know now that we could help you know, as a low income country for HPV testing with a, a, a immunoluminescence test who could decide if the patient is um, is uh, HPV infected by HPV 16, 18, and this test in the future could be helpful for low-income countries because it's very, very um, economic, and uh, for one dollar you could have an HPV test. And perhaps the detection of lesion in low-income country, which don't have any access to colposcopy, could be helped by colposcopic. Uh, AI substitution tools could help gynecologists or even not gynecologists, even nurses to identify which person, which patient has to be treated or uh, to be followed. That was my conclusion for today. We have a very worldwide problem, which were quite different between high and low income countries, which had not the same problem and not the same tools to treat and to screen patients. Thank you very much, Jacob, for organizing such a, a meeting with very interesting topics. And personally, I hope for you to have peace and have a, a better moment for Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. We appreciate uh, every one of you and your support. Thank you, have a nice evening and see you soon. Out. Thank you, bye. Nice.